Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe, your, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentle, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as member of, members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. I don't know how many of you have ever seen uh, Mayor Jerry Willis's uh, 52 Chevrolet or the pictures of what that truck looked like or that car looked like before he uh, restored it. Uh, I know that he had told me that there was a tree growing out in the middle of it when he found it in a junkyard and it didn't have a roof, it's a convertible, and it didn't have a roof and it was a rust bucket. My favorite picture of those restoration pictures is the one where he drives that hunk of junk into uh, Kathy's yard, and she's out there looking at it like, what in the world have you drug into my yard? Um, I thought that was pretty hilarious. But if you've ever seen it recently, you know that that car has been perfectly restored. It's a beautiful 1952 Chevrolet. In, in the early years of the automotive industry, uh, cars were made by hand, piece by piece. Cars were put together by human hands. Nowadays, uh, computers and robots assemble most cars with very little help from human hands. But to restore an old car requires the touch of human hands. To bring an old car back to life, you must use your hands and you must be passionate about what you're doing. You must be committed to the process and have a vision for what it will look like when that restoration is complete. When we put our life in God's hands, he can restore us. We know that God is passionate about each of us. He knit us together in our mother's womb and we can praise God because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he is totally committed to the restoration process of every soul on this earth. Listen to how uh, Peter puts it. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I love that, that God himself will restore us. If you are in Christ, if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then a change has taken place in you. You have said goodbye to the old man, to the old woman, uh, and all those old habits, all those old passions and practices of the past have been replaced with better behaviors. And because Jesus has restored your life, because you have been given abundant life, you are a new creation made in his image. And that is the end result to look like Christ. Amen? In our text this morning, we have a clear and convincing instruction on what the new person in Christ should look like. We are told how to live this new life in Christ and what the restored life looks like. A certain and undeniable change should have taken place in our life. And that change is not something that we've done. It's something Christ has done for us and in us and through us. And as we examine our text this morning, we should remember that God is always proactive. He, he always takes the initiative in our life. He took the initiative in creation. He took the initiative in salvation by sending his son to this earth. And he takes the initiative in our restoration. And this morning, what I want to do is look at four different areas where God has taken the initiative to restore us. 
First, God chose you. Paul begins by reminding us that God chose us. And because he chose us, we enjoy a position of unique favor with God. We are holy. We have been set apart from sin. We've been set apart from the world. And and we are his people. We have, you know, this relationship with God that no one else has. We are God's unique creation, chosen to be his witnesses in this world. We were chosen to be different so that others can see his power and his glory. He restores us to demonstrate his supremacy to the world around us. Not only are we holy and set apart for God, but we are also loved by God. This means that God loves us and he wants the very best for us. Moses told the people of Israel, the Lord was devoted to you and chose you. Not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you. And because God loves us, he wants us to put that old self away, that sinful life, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And when we put our life in the master's hand, he can make all things new. Secondly, God changes you. He he changes you on the inside, and it's reflected on the outside. This past Friday was Aldersgate Day. It's the anniversary uh, of John Wesley attending a meeting on Aldersgate Street. And in his journal, Wesley describes it this way. While he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Wesley had a deeply transforming inner experience, and it was reflected outwardly by the way he lived the rest of his life. And from that moment on, John Wesley was a different man. God wants to restore you. He wants to restore your relationship with him and with others. He wants to restore your trust in him. He wants you to t- trust his provision, his providence, and, and he wants to, you to trust him in all areas of your life. He wants to restore all that has been lost and broken. He wants to restore your life and everything you love. God wants to change you, but he also wants to change us and how we deal with each other, how we interact as a body of believers In our text today, Paul is clearly talking about the unity in the church. He is talking about the kind of harmony that should exist among people who really love the Lord and have the Holy Spirit living in them. And all this should be seen in light of God's command for us to love one another. Remember that love binds all things together. Isaiah said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. So what are these garments of salvation? What is Paul asking us to put on this morning? First, he says, put on compassion. As Christians, we are part of the same family, and we should not be indifferent to one another. We should not be cruel or harsh or cold to one one another. Uh, One of the characteristics of a, a genuine Christian is that we possess heartfelt compassion for each other. We should have the same compassion for each other as Christ has for us today. Then we are to put on kindness. A a person who is kind has good things to say about others, is considerate of the feelings of others. Their words are tempered with grace and with tenderness. A a kind person is not abrupt or harsh, but is soft-hearted and genuinely cares about others. Every one of us knows someone whose manner and smile communicates kindness, even if they never say a word. Then we are to put on humility. This means we are to submit ourselves to one another, to put the needs of others before our own, and not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. In God's economy, it is the humble who are exalted and the proud who are brought down. If Jesus humbled himself even to death on the cross, We need to humble ourselves as well. And then we are to put on meekness. But meekness is not weakness. The Bible says that Jesus was meek, but we know that he was not weak. 
Meekness from a biblical perspective is strength under control. I love that definition. Strength under control. It, it takes a greater inner strength to exhibit meekness than it does to become angry and lose control. And then we are to put on patience. This is long-suffering in the face of injury or insult. It's the ability to respond in love when others treat us poorly. How many of you have been treated poorly by someone else? I know I'm the only one. Well, there's a few of you. You know, in this world, we're going to have trouble, but take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. Amen? Patience is not possible in our own strength, and the world does not teach patience, does it? We, we learn patience from God. In Romans, God is called the God of patience. He, he is able to grant that grace for, uh, to those who look to him and depend on him for patience. He, he is our reliance. He, he, he's who we rely on. We rely on God, and, and we accept his will for our lives, and that enables us to endure and to wait patiently for God to act. So the question is this, will you give in to worldly pressures and act like the world, or will you allow Christ to have control of your life and clothe you in the garments of salvation? When we are clothed in these Christ-like characteristics, two things take place. The first is this, we are able to bear with one another. That means we are able to put up with or tolerate one another. It means that we endure their immaturity in Christ, their lack of discipline, their lack of faith, and their lack of commitment. And they endure ours. Amen. And the only way we can do this is through forgiveness. And that's the second thing that happens when we are clothed in these characteristics. We forgive one another, even as Christ has forgiven us. Even if you have a valid complaint against someone, forgive them. For the Christian, forgiveness may not be easy, but it's not an option either. It is the essential characteristic of a transformed life. Patience and forgiveness are never a problem when we're talking about people we love, is it? It's never a problem when we're talking about people that we truly love. And because God has restored us to fellowship with Him, we love the people of God, even as He loves them. And thirdly, God calls us. The word translated called means to summon or to call your name. As if you have been summoned to court or to the table of a king. Uh, the imagery here is that God has called us out of the world to live in His eternal presence. In His presence there is peace. He's the Prince of Peace. So when we're present with Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we're naturally, we're naturally going to enjoy that peace. And there's no fighting in between His people. If Christians could simply picture themselves in the presence of God where His holiness, His might, His splendor, His glory were on display, then there would always be unity and peace in the body. What Paul is saying here is that the peace of God should govern our hearts. It should control and, and have power over our lives. Paul told the Philippians, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now don't misunderstand me. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to have peace with each other. Uh, the wrong way is to leave sin unchecked, to compromise truth for unity, or to allow the devil a foothold in your life. The right way is by speaking the truth in love, by confronting sin and then forgiving the sinner. And because we are called or summoned into his presence, we are to allow his peace to arbitrate all of our dealings with one another. In other words, we are not in charge. God is in charge of our fellowship. It's like I told the first service this morning, if you walked into John Bush's courtroom, you would not be in charge. And in the presence of the king, you are not in charge. God is in charge. He arbitrates how we behave with each other, how we treat one another. And lastly, God counsels you. There's so much that we can say about the Word of God this morning, about its promises, its power, its prophecies, its principles, and its priorities. But the context of, of what Paul is saying here is the instructive nature of the Word of God as we meditate on it. 
as we ingest it as spiritual food. It changes us as we read God's Word and think about God's Word and allow God's Word to find residence in our heart. He's talking about the fruit that is born from instruction. It is the richness of God's Word and the fruit that that Word bears in our lives. In Psalm 25, King David says this, Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me for you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. As his word teaches us, we in turn instruct and teach and admonish one another. And yes, we are accountable to God for one another, particularly in the local church. We, we, we remind ourselves that we are to be responsible for each other whenever someone joins our church. Amen? That we covet together to help each other, to, to be in partnership with each other, and to be in partnership with God. In wisdom, we are to teach and admonish one another. Teaching is the positive side of this coin. It is where we instruct one another, where we share insights and truths and wisdom with each other. And admonition, on the other hand, is the negative side of teaching. It means to warn or to caution others. When you love someone, you do both. How many of you have raised children or grandchildren? When you instruct them, you tell them what they should do. And then you tell them what they should not do, right? Well, God loves us. And his word tells us what we should do and what we should not do. If you don't believe me, go to Deuteronomy 28 when you go home this afternoon. The first 15 verses are blessings that come from obedience. The next 56 verses are curses that come from disobedience. He teaches us what we should do and he teaches us what we should not do. Because God's word is at home in our hearts, we are to allow it to direct our interactions with one another. We are to allow God's word to teach us, to counsel us as we teach and admonish one another. And this is all done in the attitude of praise and worship as we give thanks to God for all that he has done for us. Paul is insightful here. Some people, when they admonish or teach others, assume a condescending or holier-than-thou attitude. But what the scripture is teaching us this morning is that our attitude should be one of praise and worship, one of gratitude and thanksgiving. When you are focused on praising God, upon worshiping Him, upon thanking Him for all that He has done, it will keep you in His presence, mindful of His mercy and mindful of His grace and mindful of our own unworthiness. And it will keep you from having a wrong attitude toward others. Our gratitude causes us to be careful how we carry the name of Christ. It causes us to be mindful of the fact that we are called Christians and that our actions reflect to the world the reality of Christ. In other words, you may be the only Christ some people ever meet on this earth. Think about that for a second. That's what it means to do something in the name of Christ, to do it on His behalf, under His authority and according to His will. So let me ask you a question this morning. Has this wonderful change taken place in your life? Has God's glorious light filled the darkness of your soul? Has it changed the way you treat other people? Has God's presence in your life given you the ability to be patient with others, to forgive others, and to love others more than you love yourself? Has your life been restored? If not... Will you allow God to begin restoring your life today so that he who has begun that good work in you can bring it to completion? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for your word, how it instructs us, how it teaches us, how it counsels us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, this day and we ask you to make us teachable. Help us to be that clay that is moldable in your hands. Create us to be the people that you have created us to be. Help us to be the men and women of Christ that we need to be not only in this church, but in our community and in this world. We thank you, Lord, today for loving us so much, for caring for us, for choosing us, for changing us, 
for counseling us and for calling us. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This morning, maybe you have decided that it's time for God to begin that restoration project in you. And if you've decided that, we pray that you will share that with someone. You can come forward this morning, and I would be happy to pray with you. Or maybe today you've decided to join this church, this circle of love. Whatever God has laid on your heart to do this morning, be obedient to what he is calling you to do.